So today was my recovery day. I've learned that um, I need to schedule my downtime and my recovery time before mm -hmm. my body decides just to cancel my schedule on its own. I'm not an expert on it yet because when I'm on the go, I want to continue to be on the go because I know that there's going to be a time where I won't be able to do it. So I want to take advantage mm -hmm. of it, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. But that's counterproductive. But anywho, it's June. It's Men Mental Health Awareness Month. From a male perspective, what do you think that's missing um, when it comes to the conversation about mental health and men? You know, you talk about taking today to kind of gather yourself and refresh after such a busy weekend with the mm -hmm. conference and the networking and this, that, and the other. And I think that part of the conversation is understanding that what you use or what an individual may do to kind of regenerate and regroup is not necessarily what another individual may do in order right. to regroup and to regenerate. And I think that oftentimes when we look at the conversation of mental health, oftentimes it becomes one of those things where people say, well, well what do you do? What works for you? And it's like, well, what works for me may not work for you. So I think that's one thing that's important. And, and then the other thing is it has to be modeled. And hmm. so, you know, we talk about the percentage of homes where dad is not around, where, you know, there isn't that male figure to model what, what it is to be a man. And if that individual isn't around, then they also cannot be there or aren't there to model what it looks like to relax, to yeah. take a deep breath, to decompress. You know, you touch on a point that I think it's important. You mentioned, you know, when, when we have the conversation of some households not having the, the presence of, of the father in the household, right? And, and kids mm -hmm. are not having that um, example to follow. Do you think that because women are kind of leading that mental health advocacy right that movement when mm -hmm. we talk when we think about mental health we're talking about you know doing that positive self-talk right and we talk a lot about journaling and unfortunately i think that all of this activities have been linked to like a feminine vibe right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um these are activities that i have noticed that men don't necessarily want to partake in and maybe mm -hmm. um it's my interpretation of like, because women are leading and we are the ones that do journal and stickers, right? It, it, it seems like it's, <laughs> it's more of like a feminine um, activity and, and we are not seeing the benefits of it and how it, it really impacts everybody, right? So do you think that that could have like a negative implication? And the thing is that as men, we are more driven to a solution. It's just the way we're wired. We're looking for a solution. And I think that's why some men have trouble actually taking their foot off the gas pedal. And because we're solution driven, when you talk about journaling, oftentimes it can be perceived as though journaling produces little to no results because mm -hmm. I sit down, I open a notebook, I take a pen or a pencil, and I begin to write. Great. After I've written, I still got to get back to work. And so I think most men just think, well, skip the writing and let's just get to work. Yeah. <laughs> and I use journaling as an, exam uh, as an example, mm -hmm. but when we talk about mental health, we definitely need to talk about our emotions, right? And our feelings. Mm -hmm. And... um. It has been my experience that when we talk about emotions and feelings, unfortunately, it has been linked to like a mm -hmm. feminine action and men mm -hmm. don't talk about emotions. Men don't talk about feelings. If a man is well, trying they do, but to differently. express, but if a man is trying to express their emotions, the first thing that I've heard, you know, throughout the years and history, it's man mm -hmm. up, you need to man up or, and even, even women, like, 
I, I have, you know, um, I've worked with a lot of families and with a lot of young mothers and you repeat, you know, you repeat what you see, right? You, you learn mm -hmm. by example. And even if you are trying to break cycles, sometimes you just fall into that automatic behavior because you, you know, you, it's what you know, right? Mm -hmm. So I've, I've known a lot of um, young mothers that have said this narrative to their boys, like, you know, men up, you can't cry. Boys don't cry. You know, when we cry and we feel stress, our body releases a lot of cortisol, right? And a lot of adrenaline. Mm -hmm. And our tears have cortisol. When we are crying, we are legit releasing the excess of cortisol in the body. And the excess of cortisol in the body, if it's not handled properly and it doesn't go back into a nor uh, into like a, a baseline, it really damages your organs. And this is why, you know, this is my theory that um, we all know that if we don't express emotions, if we don't, if we high pain, um, later on in life, we are going to, you know, se va a somatizar in your body. You, mm -hmm. you start feeling like those somatic symptoms, right? And your your organs to start they start getting um, shut down, and you start having those like health issues. I remember um, someone that was close to me was having a lot of health problems, and the doctor told her, "You need to heal. You need to forgive. <laughs> you need mm -hmm. to forgive. You need to heal. You need to cry it out." So my theory is that when we hold on those tears, right, we are not going through like the normal motion that the lord created in our body to release that extra cortisol but we don't cry it out because that it's not socially acceptable or because men don't cry blah 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 so we mm -hmm. keep all of this cortisol levels to a high level in our system and then we see you know medical problems later down the road when you get the flu shot they actually just give you the flu and so yes i got <laughs> i was a store manager and I was working, obviously, with the, the management team. And on this particular day, I had gone to get the flu shot. So I got really sick. And I was literally just stuck in bed. And I call in, and I spoke to a colleague of mine. And I said, hey, listen, I'm not going to be able to come in today. And, and he's like, well, why not? And I'm like, well, because I got the flu shot. And it's just beating me up. Like I'm, I'm stuck in bed. I can't do anything. And he says to me, come on, just come in. It'll be an easy night. We'll make it so that all you have to do is office work and not even that. And so he's trying to encourage me to, to, you know, to get up and get moving and get to work. It'll be an easy night. And as I'm thinking about it, and as he, he's convincing me, he's convincing me to, to do it. He says the magic words be a man. <laughs> yeah. And the moment, the moment he said, be a man, I said, what? You know, it is an interesting thing because when David is passing away, one of the last words he says to his son Solomon is be a man. Mm -hmm. And so this phrase of be a man is something that holds a lot of weight. The problem is that we never actually say, what does it mean to be a man? Ooh, and, yes. you know, in the case of David talking with Solomon, he says, be a man and follow the ordinance and commands of God and he will prosper you. So he gives them clear direction of what it means to be a man. Most often, though, no one follows it up by saying, hey, be a man. A man does this. So when we get to the part of crying, of being emotionally intelligent, of being vulnerable, of being able to show some type of emotion, people often say, hey, be a man. It's like, okay, well, what does that mean? It's like, well, men don't cry. It's like, But it's like men are not humans. It's taking right. the humanity out of men. And that mm -hmm. is not just the same way that there's times that society takes the humanity out of women and, and we are seen as a, you know, as a specific role. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's okay for men to... For, for society to take the humanity out of out of a man's life. It's what makes us completely different from every, any other species out there in the world. But I was saying in, in the conference this weekend that, 
you know, we classify emo emotions. We have emotions in a hierarchy, right? Love, mm -hmm. joy, happiness is on top. They're on top, and grief, um, sadness, anger. They're on the bottom, right? I'm mm -hmm. I'm one that believes that emotions just are. They they just exist. Mm -hmm. They're they're neither positive or, nor negative. Right. Um, and they're just allowing us to assess our environment and make informed decisions. If you're feeling happy, you know, you're assessing the situation. Okay, this means that I could continue to engage in this activity. This means that I could continue to engage in conversations with this person, right? If you're feeling upset, okay, maybe it's 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 an invitation to assess the situation as well. Okay, I'm feeling upset, I'm feeling frustrated. So I think that all of that conversation is important, but we want to strip men out of humanity and out of feelings. And if as society, we say things like this, that emotions are in a hierarchy and there's good emotions and bad emotions, whenever men feel you know, anger or frustration, they're going to start feeling bad about themselves. To your point, and I agree with you, right? Emotions, Feelings are neither good nor bad. It's what we do with those feelings and those emotions. I can I can get mad. I can get frustrated. I can get irritated. In fact, there's a biblical portion that says that you know you you can get mad, but don't allow your anger to cause you to sin. And yes. so, getting mad is not the issue. The issue is what I do with that emotion. What I do with that feeling. Of course. To that point, I think it's a very interesting that oftentimes in the churches and speaking from within the Latin community, they'll say the phrase, no es emoción, es espíritu, right? It's not emotion, God. it's the spirit of God. God, God, yeah. God. I have a, mm, yes, go ahead. <laughs> you know, as I'm growing up in the gospel, as I'm, you know, 15, 16 years old, I'm hearing that and even much younger. And it's like, it's easy to regurgitate what you've heard, especially when you hear your peers say it. You're like, well, it has to make sense. But as, as time progressed, and I thought about that statement, it's like, well, wait a minute. No, there there, there is some emotion uh, involved in this. You feel the joy of the Lord. Well, joy is an emotion. Yeah. <laughs> so to, say, yeah. to say that it, it is not emotion, it's, it's, it does what, exactly what we're saying here, where it devalues these emotions these feelings that we have and and i truly believe that this is what make us one of the things that make us like our creator like god if, if you go into the scripture you could see that you know god had all of all of the range of emotion every he felt everything in the emotional wheel i don't know if you're familiar with the emotional wheel yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but he felt everything in that emotional wheel right and if if we are feeling them, it's because, you know, we are in, in his image and likeness. And I don't think that we should suppress all of these emotions that he has given us. Like you said, it's what we do with them. And unfortunately, I think that because we have that saying within the church, it's not emotions, it's the spirit. We are not teaching anybody what to do with emotions because we are teaching them to suppress. Oftentimes, it feels like that those are only the two conversations we're having where it's either your emotions do matter or your emotions don't matter. And so you have that type of. We love to polarize things. It's, it's either, or as, as human, in, as humans, we just like to put everything in black and white and we forget <laughs> about the end, right. Yep. About merging things that life, it's more complicated than just, you know, black or white or like left or right you know, kind of bringing this conversation back where it's like, well, why aren't men speaking from a point of here's how I feel or really just opening themselves up to the possibility of mental health and transparency? I think, you know, it's a big conversation, but I think one of the things we have to look at is if it's not being role modeled at home, if it's not being role modeled in the community, and then we look at the church and we say, well, surely the church is going to help in this conversation. And then we hear the, the preacher, the pastor, the minister say, it's not emotion, it's spirit. It's like, okay, but my emotions actually don't matter <laughs> because, because well, I have to move. It, you know, it's, it, 
I'm going to tell you something. I had um someone that was close to me at some point in life. And mm -hmm. this person told me, you know, when I went to church, I got saved. And they said, you know, in church, your past doesn't matter anymore. The Lord, you know, threw mm -hmm. everything in the bottom of the ocean, in the bottom of the yeah. sea. You don't have to worry about that. It's completely a new life. And this person was not willing to look at anything from their past because it's like, no, the Lord already forgot about that. But, <laughs> you know, we're not really doing any type of, you know, internal healing or like not necessarily seeing how the, the, the past was in, impacting their future. And this person was like completely convinced. But the church told me that. I don't have to worry about my past. So why do we need mm -hmm. to talk about it? Why do, you know, why do I have to go here? Or why do I have to meet with you every other week to talk about this? Like, I don't, I don't need to do this because my, my life is completely new since I accepted Jesus. And I think this is part of the conversation that needs to take place within the church, because like you're saying, you know, this little things that we say, sometimes even as a cliche within the church community could really impact people negatively. This past Sunday, I was speaking at the church and I asked the question to the church. I said, think about this. Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross and he's in a garden praying and his prayer and his pain was so intense that he started weeping. And as he cried, the tears were like blood tears. Do you think he felt peace at that moment? Like, do you think he felt peace when he's on the cross and he says, Father, why have you forsaken me? Like, no, he didn't feel peace. And so I think part of the exercise that as individuals we can do is that when we consider this scripture, let us not remove the humanity of the people of the scripture. Like when we read Abraham or you know, being told to sacrifice his son. Yes. Like there's a lot of emotion there. Yes. And, and I love that you said, let's not take out, you know, the humanity of, of the people that, you know, of this people that we, we read their stories in the Bible, Abraham, or you talk about Elijah, right. Getting in, in, in going into the cave, David mm -hmm. experiencing depression and, um, even in their, in, you know, in their highs and in their lows, what people say, yeah, but that's, that's David. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. but you're not David, or, but you're not Paul. I'm like, <laughs> what, what makes you different than me? <laughs> 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 what makes them different? Oh, they have been chosen by God. I'm like, you and I have been chosen by God, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and I think that, I think it's dangerous when we put the bible characters within a pedestal thinking that they were more spiritual than us or that they didn't you know they have more control of things than us because i i think it it, it puts us in a disadvantage i think mm -hmm. that um it's not realistic and again this is where it the the shame and the guilt comes in because we are having emotions and we are experiencing these feelings and I truly believe that this is the way that the Lord has the way the, the way the Lord communicates with us sometimes. And it's there's signals so we could reassess our, our situations and make good choices and inform choices in the future. You know, as as we talk about this conversation, you know, as we talk about mental health, as we talk about becoming emotionally aware and emotionally intelligent, as we talk about these things, it's so easy for me to say you know what forget it it's in god's hands it's like wait a minute it is it is but at the same time you may have verbally released it in god's hands but have you emotionally addressed it and that's Ooh! the conversation oh that is a facebook post brother <laughs> <laughs> and so i think you know that's that's the conversation right it's yeah. it's having that dialogue and Again, I think as as preachers, as teachers, as people who have any type of audience attention that we can communicate, we need to be able to have that part of the conversation as well. That that it is sometimes emotionally difficult to 
believe. It is sometimes emotionally difficult. And it's like, okay, well, we can have that conversation. Yeah, so talk about your difficulty. And, mm-hmm. of course, there it requires a level of vulnerability. And, you know, I'll caveat with saying that, yeah, sure, you're not going to be emotionally vulnerable with everybody. But you should have somebody that you converse with. And, of course, most individuals will reply and say, well, I have Jesus Christ. And it's like, well, that's good for you. But the Bible says that we are members of one another, members of one body. And so Christ Jesus has given us the body that is the church so that we may support one another. And faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. And the word of God isn't just the sermon the preacher preaches on Sunday. The word of God is your testimony, your struggle, your challenge, and your transparency as you navigate with the spirit through your emotional situations on what he's going to do.